Well, I guess uh, you could say that I um, don't want to repeat anything, but um, it's been a bumpy ride <laughs> uh, through the last few years. First the pandemic, war in Ukraine, now Israel-Gaza, lots of other unexpected events uh, and developments. So what have you learned, uh, Nikos, that's maybe new uh, during the past four years um, about un investing in uncertain times? And have you got any kind of guardrails that you can share with us? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me again in this uh, uh, very distinguished uh, conference. Um, I mean, there's no doubt, and maybe you've discussed this in the last couple of days, that the macro environment is in transition, uh, to say the least. You, you look at the economy today, the expectation is overall, I would say, the consensus that there's not going to be a recession next year. You guys at The Economist are closer to it to, to judge if this is the case, but everybody is saying that probably we have avoided recession so far. Uh, when you look at inflation, of course, uh, it's easing, but it's not still at the target. And these geopolitical events that you were talking earlier on at the panel naturally are impacting inflationary uh, pressures. And then you have the interest rates, which certainly have impacted I would say the most at this stage um, on where we are at. And, uh, and that means, and again, the consensus is that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer. And as investors, we need to adjust to this and expect on what will happen with interest rates staying higher for longer. Now, um, there is always a lag in the economy, and we've seen it, that there is a lag between uh, how the macro effects happen, what the geopolitical effects happen, and what impact this has on the real economy, and of course about uh, investing itself. The truth is that in this environment, pricing risk is difficult, it's challenging. I think when we look at any investments we make in this environment, naturally, we need to be more cautious. Um, we are expecting that valuations are gonna come down. We are expecting that multiples are gonna come down, and it's natural. Partly because it's mathematical, you know, when interest rates go, go up, valuations will come down. But also because the conservative nature and the uncertainty that this environment presents means that we'll have to be more conservative when we assume uh, what we'll exit at. So a lot of what we're doing uh, as a firm, but I suspect a lot of our peers, is focusing back on the fundamentals. Looking at buying good businesses and making sure we're buying uh, businesses where we can add value, we can create value, and be much more hands-on investors. So I think you will see us as investors uh, going back to the basics, looking at fundamentals. Don't expect that we will uh, see valuations increasing substantially in the short term, and try to price risk in this environment. Okay, well, thanks for that. And just to follow up then, um, given um, the, the difficulties, are you optimistic? in these times, um, you know, how are you going about making your investment decisions? Well, am I optimistic? I would say there's no doubt this, this environment has been challenging and, and it's difficult to be on paper optimistic, but yes, I am optimistic. I think if you look at this crisis that we're, we're facing, it's not a, a crisis, um, it's not a financial crisis and it's, mm -hmm. it's not a financial bubble that we had in uh, 2008. This is very much driven by a demand-based inflation. Um, it's driven by rising interest rates, as we were saying earlier on. Uh, and therefore, all these things point, in my mind, to an economic, to a, to an economic cycle, mm -hmm. which means that um, I believe that this is going to be mu much more short-term lived. If you look at the capital markets, they are orderly. The labor markets are very strong. The balance sheets of private companies is very strong. Uh, and there's a lot of liquidity in the system, both in the banks, but certainly uh, from investors. So I, I am optimistic because I think, as we've seen in other periods of crisis, this uh, is probably going to be a bit more short term. And I hope it's going to be more short term by definition. But I think all the signs are that it's likely to be the case. So what do you look for uh, in this environment? Primarily, I would say we look for industries that show secular growth that industries that have tailwinds, industries that can be supported by sort of uh, that, that growth um, uh, dynamic. So therefore, the companies do not need to run to stand still. So we're looking at industries where, um, like for example, in healthcare or in telecoms or in subscription-based businesses or, 
or other business services where you can see that the, the industries have some tailwinds and, and can support that growth. We're also looking for companies who are market leaders in these industries because we've seen, regardless of sector, that market leaders tend to have that competitive advantage. They tend to have the best management teams, they tend to have pricing power, and this is really what we focus on, to try to identify this, the industries with secular growth and companies that are market leaders within these industries that can uh, sustain this. And that's really the, the main focus that we have. But not, not uh, every company we look at really has these characteristics, and that's why it becomes even more difficult in this environment to price risk. But the reality is interest rates, um, and you will know it equally well, the last decades of interest rates at zero rates mm -hmm. was abnormal. Mm -hmm. Normal macro environment is not a zero interest rate environment. Uh, the last decade was fueled by excess liquidity in our mind, and that has resulted in a lot of the macro effects that we're, we're seeing. But that zero interest rate environment was not normal. Um, I've been fortunate to be an investor for the last 25 years. I started my career with interest rates at 8 and 9% investors were still able to make money in that environment. It's about identifying the right opportunities in identifying um, the right sectors to invest in, and of course, pricing them accordingly. Great, thanks. Um, I know your focus is um, much wider and global, but I do want to talk about Greece. Um, so, you know, we've had this comeback story and we've talked a lot about that this morning, all the positives um, achievements of uh, the recent years and there's a really good vibe around Greece at the moment mm -hmm. as you're well aware. Um, you know, is that merited or is there still some cause for, for caution about Greece? The short answer is I think it is merited um, I, and I, I think you've heard it all this, this morning and probably the last couple of days about uh, the positive momentum that the country is having, and rightly so. I think there have been taken some steps and some reforms that have taken uh, Greece through a more than decade of recession. Um, and I think, apart from the reforms, Greece has some, I would say, competitive advantages that, that make it uh, a more sustainable investment uh, destination. I think, first of all, it is a European country, it is in the Euro, it has that stability, and that's critical, especially in the world geopolitically that we live in, and it should not be underestimated. It does have an exceptional human capital. I keep saying in, in forums like this that, that Greece is a very rich country in people, and, it, and it, is a, it is a rich country in people because the human capital of this country is exceptional. And, and I think it should, it should, we should make sure that it doesn't leave the country and, and make sure that it, it, it remains here. It's also a country that has a very strong uh, small and medium enterprise base. And uh, a lot of, of where the growth is going to come from, I predict, in this market is in that segment. Um, there are, of course, some very big successful companies in the country, but a lot of the growth momentum should be and will be in that SME space, uh, which are family-owned, founder-led, and, and have done extremely well in this environment. But I would say more importantly, Greece has come through a more than a decade of recession. And it come, has come through, as you correctly said, very strongly uh, from it, but means that it, has, it is growing faster than other European markets. You see it on any statistic that we see today about GDP growth over last year, and I suspect it will be the case for 2024 which means that, that that country is going to grow faster than others. And as investors who have a choice, we like to go to markets that are growing faster than potentially some others. So I think there are some fundamental reasons why the country should be able to, to continue that, that uh, direction, should continue to attract uh, investment. But as, as, as we say, you know, you, they, need to, they need to continue doing so. And, um, and I think they are on the right track. Well, I, I guess that brings me to my final question. Um, as we also discussed, there's still challenges, there's still um, problems, there are structural issues that need to be addressed. Um, so looking from, you're a kind of inside-outside person, really, but um, uh, uh, given your um, origins, but um, you know, what, what would you say would be the most important things from an investor point of view, what would be the kind of priorities do you think to, you know, allow Greece to, you know, to make a further leap forward? 
you ask me this question every year, and yes. I think the, the, this, um, and, and every year I try to be consistent with this answer, even though I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm not going to succeed uh, in doing so. And I think you did have a lot of the previous uh, panelists also uh, commenting on this. Um, I tend to say that good is the enemy of great. And I think the, Greece has, has had a very good run so far because of all the changes that it has made, but there's still stuff to do. Previously, today, I'm sure you've heard about the need to further uh, make sure that the reforms happen when it comes to taxation, as it was mentioned earlier on, when it comes to bureaucracy. I think there's been a lot of positive steps in the digital economy, but I think there's still more, much more to do on the digitization. I strongly believe, as you know, on education. And I think that in education, including private education in this country, there's still a lot that can be done. And that will make sure that a lot of the bright minds do not leave uh, the country, and that's going to be critical. I think what is very relevant in my mind, though, instead of being very specific on what are the reforms that additional need to make, because there are a lot of policy makers in the room and there are much more um, experts than I am, I would focus on one thing. And I would say I think the role of the state is to make sure that it creates an environment that entrepreneurship can flourish. Because entrepreneurship is the engine of every economy. And, and that, for me, is what the state should continue doing. It should nurture innovation. It should make sure that we have proper entrepreneurship in this country. And that, I think, if it's consistently done, it will lead to sustainable growth. What will be, I think, detrimental for this country, who has gone back on the right track, is to lose that consistency. The consistency when it comes to reforms, consistency when it comes to measures, uh, consistency to create that environment that will, that will give that sustainable growth. And, uh, and I hope this doesn't happen. But that would be my only advice on what has to happen, because in terms of the details, I think there are better qualified people to, to answer that question. Well, thank you very much, Nikos. Thanks for coming back and talking to us again. It's a very valuable perspective, and you know, we really appreciate the input. So uh, please join me in thanking Nikos, and we're going to um, move on to our next panel. Thank you.